script. So um, this is the basic overview of the three lectures. Um, I've posted some homework at this URL. It might move to another home if I can find a better one, and also it will be updated uh, with new homework for each lecture. So I'm going to start by saying a couple of things about uh, classical chaos. So a good example to have in mind is this problem called Sinai Billiards, where you have a particle moving around inside a box with a disk as an obstacle. So the particle is moving around here, just a classical particle, and whenever it hits a wall, it reflects off it. So an example of a trajectory would be one like this. Something like that. And the idea is that if we consider a nearby trajectory that starts out with almost the same initial conditions and we follow it, then it will look very similar for a while, but um, the differences will amplify over time. And after just a few collisions, the two trajectories will end up in completely different places. So the basic idea is that more generally, if we consider the variation of some phase space coordinate of a trajectory at time t with respect to an infinitesimal perturbation to the initial condition, could be of the same coordinate or some other coordinate, then this will be growing exponentially with an exponential that's called the Lyapunov exponent. Or in general, it will be a sum of terms with the spectrum of Lyapunov exponents. Now, to discuss this in a little bit more detail, it's helpful to have a notion of expectation values, thermal expectation values, which we can define in classical systems in the following way. Define the thermal expectation value of some function of phase space at inverse temperature beta as the integral over phase space define it by this formula, where x here, capital X, represents a combined coordinate for all the phase space coordinates, including the positions and their conjugate momenta. The integral dx is an integral over phase space with a symplectic measure, and h is the energy of the system. f here could be a general function of the phase space coordinates. So in these lectures, we're going to pay um, a lot of attention to two different types of thermal expectation values that can be defined either in classical physics or in quantum physics. So we'll start by discussing them in classical physics. Um, the first of these thermal expectation values is just a um, two-point, let's say, autocorrelation function in time. So that would be defined by taking some phase space coordinate say x of t, x of zero, taking this thermal expectation value and making it connected by subtracting off this term. And the idea is that in chaotic theories, um, for late time, the behavior of this function is a spectrum of exponential decays where these parameters mu i are, um, this chalk seems extremely big. Am I using the right chalk? It's on purpose. Sorry? It's on purpose. Okay. So that you can you write big. I can write like 10 symbols per board, but, uh, <laughs> okay. Anyhow, these numbers here, um, in general, they're complex are known as Ruel resonances. And they, um, they determine the spectrum of exponential decays of these 
autocorrelation functions. So that's the mathematical statement. Um, and the physical idea is that, um, let's say in this billiards problem, after a few collisions with the wall, the particle will have forgotten its initial condition. So this two-point function is a measure of uh, sort of the thermalization of this system, the extent to which the trajectory at later times forgets the initial condition at early times. So this is the, one of the things that we'll study. Um, another uh, is, Actually, yeah. Is this valid in some average size or at each time? Yeah, so this, this expression here involves an average. So this is an integral. This expectation value with respect to beta is a thermal expectation value, an integral over phase space. No, at late time, it's six. This, this is supposed to be true at late time, of some of these different rural resonances. So part of this classical, right? So it actually goes to zero. Yeah, so far we're discussing classical physics. OK, so um, the other thermal expectation value that we'll be discussing in detail are what we'll call out of time order uh, four point functions or um, double commutators. The, reason for calling them this will become clearer when we discuss quantum physics a little bit later. But we can get the idea the, with a similar quantity in classical physics. So let's imagine computing the expectation value of a derivative of x of t with respect to the initial condition. This quantity is supposed to be exponentially growing along a particular trajectory. But it might have either sign. And when we average it over the thermal ensemble, there can be cancellations. So a better quantity is to take the thermal average of the square of this thing. And this is expected to be growing with a spectrum of exponential growths, um, where these parameters here, lambda j, are the Lyapunov exponents. And the physics of this is just the sensitivity to initial perturbations of the trajectory. This is supposed to remain true for all t? Uh, yeah, but um, I should qualify that with the following statement. If we cons this is for infinitesimal perturbations, because we're taking a derivative here. But if we consider finite perturbations, so let's say we consider a finite difference, delta x of t with respect to delta x of 0, then this quantity, if the initial perturbation is small, will initially grow exponentially. But it can't get any bigger than the size of the system divided by the small perturbation that we make squared. So it will have to saturate at some, at, let's say the system is compact, at some value like this at a time that's logarithmic in this parameter. So that would be the case if we studied finite differences. But if we study these infinitesimal differences, which were reflected by the derivatives, <laughs> then it can grow exponentially. What is Sorry? What is, um, delta? delta is some finite difference that we make to the initial perturbation. Now, if we like, we can rewrite. Um, We can rewrite this square of the derivative as a square of a Poisson bracket. That would be a Poisson bracket between x of t and p of 0. But more generally, we expect um, exponential deviation of almost any quantity with respect to almost any perturbation so that we expect uh, Poisson brackets of general functions of phase space, w of t, uh, with respect to other general functions of phase space at earlier times. We expect these things also to be growing with actually the same spectrum of uh, Lyapunov exponents. So the mini summary of classical chaos 
is that we have these two sort of qualitative phenomena that are related. One is thermalization. The system forgets its initial condition. That thing can be diagnosed by these two-point functions, and in particular, the spectrum of Rowell resonances characterizes the late time behavior. The other qualitative phenomenon is the sensitivity to perturbations to the initial conditions. Those things can be diagnosed using these um, squares of Poisson brackets. And they're characterized by a spectrum of Lyapunov exponents. So they're growing. Yeah? So for what operators do you expect this to be This should be for pretty much any function of the phase space coordinates. It's the classical statement of the butterfly effect that almost any perturbation that you do now will have a large impact on anything that you measure sufficiently later. Yeah, those things will depend on the operators that you're considering. But not on the initial conditions. I don't know what you mean by the initial conditions. This involves an integral over phase space. <clears throat> okay, so now we'd like to discuss these same concepts in, in quantum physics, but one point, uh, let me finish the following. One point is that um, in order to have a good notion of this exponential growth, we have to be able to consider small perturbations to the system. And this, there isn't always a good notion of small perturbations in quantum systems, but there are a few classes of systems where we can do that. So one is um, semi-classical systems. So if we just take this particle moving in um, the billiards that I erased a moment ago, and we make it a quantum mechanical particle and study it high enough energies, or we study it with small enough h-bar, then the classical analysis will apply for a while. And we can use the correspondence between commutators and Poisson brackets to conclude that, for example, x of t, p of 0 squared should be growing like h bar squared times Lyapunov exponents. This approach was discussed um, quite a while ago by Larkin and Ovchinikov, and we won't talk about it too much more in these lectures. Another type of system where there's a good notion of a small perturbation are large n quantum systems, where if we have many particles interacting with each other, then an obvious notion of a small perturbation would be to perturb just one of them, and then you can ask how that perturbation can spread to affect the entire system. This is something that we'll discuss quite a lot. And a final example, which we'll talk about today, are um, extended quantum systems that aren't necessarily large n. In this case, again, you have a notion of a small perturbation, just ping one part of a large system and ask whether that perturbation later affects the whole system. We can discuss that question, but um, in general, it's thought that in this case, you don't have exponential growth of these um, types of quantities, but you do have growth. OK, so there was a question. So what did you mean that uh, there's no small perturbations in the quantum system? Sorry, there was a, um, yeah, so in general, um, it might be that almost any reasonable perturbation that you make um, that's enough to take the state to an orthogonal state will raise the energy of the system by a large amount, and you won't be studying small perturbations to the thermal equilibrium. There was another question earlier. Yeah, the question on the middle board. So uh, how is there a four-point function? Is there a four-point function of Yeah. So that connection goes via the Poisson bracket. So we could write that expression as a Poisson bracket of x of t with p of 0, and it's a square of a Poisson bracket. So in quantum mechanics, we would get a square of a commutator, which is a type of four-point function. It's a sum of four-point functions. Yeah? So in quantum mechanics, does the exponential growth follow for all time? No, it does not. <clears throat> OK.
we expect this behavior in chaotic classical systems. That's what we've discussed so far. OK, so now we're going to move to quantum mechanics. And I'm going to sketch a um, qualitative introduction that's supposed to give a second motivation for considering, considering these out of time order correlation functions. So let's imagine that we have a nice interacting quantum system. And at t equals 0, we have a state that represents approximate thermal equilibrium at inverse temperature beta. So this horizontal line here is supposed to represent an almost thermal equilibrium state of some quantum system. If we evolve this forward in time, then we're going to remain in approximate thermal equilibrium. So at a later time, t will again get a cartoon of the state of the system that looks like that. But let's now make this slightly more interesting by acting on the state with an approximately local operator at some location within the system. Let's say v acts over here. And that might introduce a little perturbation a little bit of excess energy density and some quantum information associated to this operator v that we acted with. But if the system thermalizes, then as we evolve later in time, this perturbation will sort of dissolve into the thermal soup. This is the type of thing that can be diagnosed with the two-point function of the v operators in time. But the later time, although it's approximately the state at the later time, although it's approximately in equilibrium, secretly remembers the perturbation, one way to expose that would be to evolve it back in time to t equals 0. This little blip corresponding to the v operator will rematerialize. Yeah? Um, do you assume that we, we have like a heat equation or something that would dissipate this initial? No. OK. Um, OK. So, but before we evolve the state back from t to t equals 0, we can imagine acting with a second operator, w, at some other state in the system. So now we're considering the state w of t times v of 0 acting on beta. And we can ask, when we evolve this back to t equals 0, whether the v blip will still rematerialize. And the claim is that if the system is chaotic and the time difference t is large enough, then it will not that this perturbation will be enough to interfere with the reassembly of the v perturbation. And when we get back to t equals 0, we'll have approximate thermal equilibrium again. So this is supposed to be the cartoon description of this state. If we put the operators in the other order, v of 0 first, v of zero first and then w of t, then the cartoon we would draw would be something like this, where there's a blip visible at the location of the v operator but none at the location of the w operator. Of course, this is only possible if the operators fail to commute. Um, one way of diagnosing this is to note that, based on these pictures, the states should be distinguishable from each other, and so almost orthogonal. That means that um, if we consider the out-of-time order correlator, which is the inner product of, let's say, this ket vector with the bra vector of the other state. That this should become small for large time. That's the statement that these states are distinguishable from each other. Now, in what follows, in order to simplify some of the formulas, I'm going to make an assumption, which isn't necessary but convenient, that the operators v and w are both unitary and hermitian. So because they're unitary, we can ignore these daggers here. And Sorry, because they're hermitian, we can ignore the daggers. And because they're unitary, we'll conclude that v squared is equal to 1, and w squared is also equal to 1. That makes the following argument slightly simpler. Um, instead of considering the out-of-time order correlator, we can study something which is closely related, which we'll call C of t, the double commutator. And this is the thermal expectation value of minus the commutator squared between w of t and v of 0. 
If we expand this thing out, there are four terms. We have terms that look like W V V W plus V W W V. And then we have terms with a minus sign that look like W V W V minus V W V W, where I'm omitting the time arguments. Because we've assumed that these operators are Hermitian and unitary, these are equal to one. And these two terms together sum up to twice the real part of this quantity. So C of t is two times one minus the real part of the out of time order correlative. So that means that the information that these guys contain is basically equivalent. And in these lectures, we're going to go back and forth in between them. Let me just draw the schematic um, expected behavior of these functions um, as a function of time, just to emphasize the relation between them. At t equals zero, let's say these operators act on different sites so that the commutator is zero. But um, at late times, the commutator will be large and will take a value to c is approximately two. While the out of time order correlator starts out equal to one and decreases to zero. Okay. There was a question? Okay, yeah. Do you also have a universal behavior of how the curve saturates? It's, at least in examples, the saturation here is controlled by the same um, behavior as the <coughs> decay of the two point function. So these are well resonance like quantities. It's but, also, it's also exponential. Sorry? Also exponential. Well, actually, in general, you expect to have power law tails, but um, you can also have that for the two point functions. But there's a part of it that would be exponential and determined. Well, I'll discuss that a little bit more tomorrow. Yes? Sorry? Yeah, V and W should be reasonably low energy operators so that they don't change the energy of the thermal state very much. It doesn't matter. Okay, so One thing that should be sort of clear is that there's a lot that's interesting going on in the time evolution of these operators, because we start with operators V and W that might be simple operators acting only on one site in the system. These blips were separated from each other. But if we evolve them in time, somehow they manage to have large commutators with each other. So we'd like to understand uh, we're going to be continuing the sort of qualitative mode for a little while. Um, how these operators grow. So we can write the time evolution of an operator W of t. That's e to the i h t w, e to the minus i h t as a sum, this is the Campbell-Baker-Hausdorff formula of i t to the k over k factorial times k fold iterated commutators of the Hamiltonian with the operator w. Now, to discuss this formula in more detail, it's going to be convenient to um, work with a particular Hilbert space of operators, um, particular Hilbert space on the operators that are acting on them. 
And one obvious choice would be to use qubits to think about a Hilbert space, which is acted, a Hilbert space of n qubits, where the operators would be tensor products, natural operators would be tensor products of Pauli operators. But um, I'm going to use something which is slightly, has a slightly simpler algebra, which are the Majorana fermions. So we're going to consider n Majorana fermions, psi 1 up to psi n. These are operators that satisfy um, the algebra psi i, psi j equals, um, I'll use a convention where there's a factor of 2 here, 2 times delta ij. This is the algebra of Dirac gamma matrices in n Euclidean space-time dimensions. The reason for using these instead of Pauli operators is just that this algebra is slightly simpler than the algebra of Pauli operators, and we don't have to be writing x's, y's, and z's. But they can be built out of Pauli operators. So for example, if n equals 2, then we can take psi 1 equals sigma x, and psi 2 equals sigma y. Um, and if we want to do n equals 4, we want to have four of these, then we need to work in the Hilbert space of two qubits. And we'll call these the qubit operators acting on the first site. And we have to add also sigma z, sigma x. So proceeding in this way, we can write these Majorana fermions in terms of products of sigma z's with either a sigma x or a sigma y at the end. This is just a convenient set of operators to discuss this operator growth problem with. So tensor products of these Majorana fermion operators are a complete basis for all of the operators. So we can expand a general time-evolving operator, W of t, as a sum of the following kind, sum over s. What well, s means will become clear in a second. So S here labels the number of fermions that are appearing in a given product. And then we're summing over the, these indices with coefficients A of t. We can write a general operator in this way. Now, the set of operators acting on the Hilbert space are themselves a Hilbert space. And it's sometimes convenient to think about this as an expansion of uh, a vector in that Hilbert space, which is this operator in terms of a complete basis, which are these tensor products of these fermion operators. And in that way of thinking about it, these coefficients here are like the wave function, the wave function for this evolving operator. In order to make the notation simpler, I'm sometimes going to write this double sum over s and over these indices here um, using the notation sum over capital I of, let's say, a i of t, and so on, where capital I is a collective index for both s and this combination of individual fermion indices. So we'd like to understand how this wave function, this set of coefficients, encodes the behavior of these decay of these two-point functions and the growth of these um, double commutators. Um, it's convenient to work at infinite temperature, and we're going to do that for a little while. So their expectation values in the infinite temperature state are just given by 1 divided by the dimension of the Hilbert space, which is 2 to the n over 2, times the trace of the operator. This is just the statement that the infinite temperature density matrix is the identity matrix divided by the dimension of the Hilbert space. 
This is convenient because this basis of Fermion operators, of, of, um, of operators, um, has a nice notion of orthonormality here. So in particular, the expectation value of psi i times psi j is equal to delta i j. Something that follows simply from that orthonormality is that the sum of the squares of those coefficients, a i of t, should be constant in time. And if we normalize the initial operator to 1, then the sum of the squares will be equal to 1 for all time. That's the normalization of the wave function of this evolving operator. Another thing that's um, obvious from this statement is that the two-point function, let's say psi 1 of t with psi 1 of 0, is just given by a1 of t, this expansion coefficient for the operator psi 1 in the wave function. And the basic idea is that for late time t, this operator psi 1 of t can become a complicated product, sum of products of many different fermion operators. And the two-point function expresses the amplitude for it to be just a single one of those operators, psi 1. And that can become small just because the wave function is normalized, and there are many different terms that are contributing. OK. Now we'd like to discuss what property of this wave function is related to these um, out-of-time order correlators. So for bosonic operators, we consider the square of the commutator. And for fermionic operators like um, psi 1 of t, we consider the square of the anti-commutator. So let's consider, for example, the anti-commutator squared between psi 1 of t and psi j of 0. So to work that out, you can compute the anti-commutator of psi j with um, the expansion of the operator, which we wrote here. And that will pick up terms where the indices i1 through is contain the index j. It will get a sum of such terms. You square the sum and take the trace. But because of orthonormality, only the diagonal terms will contribute. So this is a sum over s and a sum over these indices with the constraint that they have to include j of um, a i1 to i s squared times 4, where the 4 comes from two powers of the 2 there in the anti-commutation relation. It's also useful to consider an average of this quantity, where we average this over j. So if we consider 1 over n times the sum over j of this quantity, <coughs> then a given term here will contribute to s of the terms in the sum, because there are s different fermions, which the corresponding basis element will fail to anti-commute with. So the average will have a formula like this, sum over s of s over n. The 1 over n is this factor. And the factor of s is the thing that I just described, times the sum of these basis elements, 4 times a i1 i s. So we can think about the average value of this anti-commutator squared as 
being like sort of like an expectation value in the wave function of this operator of the size. S is the number of fermions that appear in a given product. And this is proportional to the typical value of that size divided by n. So what does this mean? Um, we expect at late times for this operator, psi 1 of t, to have a large anti-commutator of order 1 with almost any other operator in the system, any other simple operator in the system. In particular, this average should be of order 1. That means that the typical terms that are contributing to the wave function, so most of the weight in the wave function of this operator, should involve very long strings of fermions, strings that have a number of fermions proportional to the size of the system, n. So it's like a macroscopic product of fermions. So there's a sense in which, for that to be true, the operator sine 1 of t has to become space filling or system filling at late time. Typical terms have to involve products of an order one fraction of the whole system. Now operators like that, in general, are pretty crazy. Like if you just consider one of these basis elements or you consider a typical operator of uh, such length, then because it's acting everywhere in the system, it, can, it would typically change the energy of the system by an amount of order n, acting on, let's say, low energy states. But this particular operator, psi 1 of t, is just the time evolution of a simple single site operator. And so it can only change the energy of the system by an amount of order 1. And that's because it's a very special linear combination of these very long products of uh, fermion operators. OK, so that's sort of the target for what, um, what these operators are supposed to look like at late time in order to, for everybody to fail to commute with each other. But we haven't explained how they get there um, and how they get there, how the operator has managed to evolve to be such such complicated things depends on the type of system that we're discussing. So in particular, it depends a lot on the structure of interactions. And I'm going to discuss two sort of qualitatively different classes. So first, let's discuss the case where the interactions are local. So as a sort of simple example of that, let's imagine that the fermions that we're considering live on a one-dimensional lattice. Then what it means that the interactions are local is that the Hamiltonian can be written as a sum of terms where a given term, HA, is a term that, let's say, couples together just a couple nearby fermions, could be two, or we could also allow terms that couple together, let's say, four. So the Hamiltonian would be written as a sum of terms like this. But we wouldn't allow terms where fermions over here are directly coupled to terms far away. So that's what it means that the Hamiltonian is local. And intuitively, in this case, if we start with a fermion at this location, it might take a while for it to um, fail to anti-commute with a fermion far away, because we need many applications of the Hamiltonian to make them fail to anti-commute. That intuition is um, um, demonstrated in a beautiful bound, uh, the Lieb-Robinson bound, which constrains the commutator, or in this case, the anti-commutator of operators in local systems. So I want to describe the proof of that bound um, for this special case. So it has to do with the, with the following quantity. So we define the quantity C, let me call it C tilde, of um, N, M, and T to be the operator norm of the anti-commutator between psi N at T and psi M. So the operator norm means the absolute value of the largest eigenvalue of the operator. Now, if this quantity is small, then this other quantity, this C of t, also has to be small. 
So N and M are sites in the system. And we could imagine our, one of the operators is here, another operator is here. This is N equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. So the way the bound is proven is the following. Uh, one considers C tilde of n, m, and t plus epsilon minus C tilde of n, m, and t. And then we would like to um, give a bound on this quantity in terms of C tilde itself. So we have to process this term, this, the function evaluated at t plus epsilon. I mean, you can write that in the following way. So this term here is equal to the operator norm psi n. We're going to make a time translation and write it in the following way. So naively, we would have put t plus epsilon here and time 0 for this operator. But we can make a time translation of both terms, multiplying this product, conjugating it by a unitary transformation that doesn't affect the norm. And translate back so that this is at time epsilon and this is at time minus t. And the next step is the step that you might, well, the next two steps are steps you might not have thought of if you were just sort of playing around with the Campbell-Baker-Hausdorff formula for these evolving operators. Um, so we replace this operator here by e to the i little h epsilon. I'll define that in a second. Minus i little h epsilon psi m of minus t. So what is little h? Little h is just the sum of um, terms in the Hamiltonian that don't commute with psi n. So those are terms in the Hamiltonian that include the site n. Because the Hamiltonian is local, there's just a bounded number of those terms. So the Hamiltonian itself is some huge operator, but little h is a bounded norm operator involving just a few different terms with products of a few fermions. OK, now I'm going to continue processing this term here for a couple more steps. So, so you've dropped in the exponent terms in capital H that don't commute with science. That's right. So they do commute. It's the, the do commute. And um, at that level of approximation, it's not really allowable to write. We shouldn't be writing it as an exponential. We should just write it as um, 1 plus i epsilon h commutator with psi n. And uh, that's the order we're working. We're going to be working to linear order in epsilon. But it's convenient to leave it in the exponential because that makes it obvious that we can move those terms to the other operator, again, by conjugating both by a unitary operator e to the i h epsilon. And we can write that first term there as um, the commutator psi n with e to the minus i h epsilon psi m of t, sorry, psi m of minus t e to the i h epsilon. OK, and it's now convenient to um, expand this inside the norm to linear order in epsilon and time translate everything back. We find the following expression. So one term is psi n of t with psi m of 0. That's at order epsilon to the 0. And the other term is um, minus i epsilon psi n of t with the commutator h of t psi m of 0. So I've now um, properly expanded this to linear order in epsilon, which was secretly the order to which we were working all along. Uh, there's some feedback here. Uh, I'm not sure if um, it's possible to fix that or if I'm doing something that's aggravating it, but it's annoying, at least to me. <laughs> um, be claiming that little h commutes with the big Hamiltonian in this last step. 
No. Uh, here, it doesn't commute with the big Hamiltonian, we, but we had to um, conjugate everything by time. So, oh, I yeah. so we time translated everything back to, back to time t. So this is little h of t. OK. So now we have this expression. This is the first term there. And we're taking the difference between these two terms, where the second term is actually just the norm of this guy. This is c tilde of n, m, and t. So the conclusion of this analysis is that um, the difference, and we can now write this as a, a bound on the derivative. The derivative uh, dt, c tilde n, m, and t, is less than or equal to just the norm of this term. So, and the norm of this term, we can bound in the following way. The norm of an anti-commutator is less than twice the product of the norms of the two operators that are participating in the anti-commutator. The norm of psi n of t is just one. So we get a factor of two. And then we need to look at the norm of this commutator. And the idea, remember what h is. h is the set of terms that, in the Hamiltonian, that uh, include the site psi n. So be in order one number of such terms, and then they will involve products of fermions near psi n. All of those terms can be bounded um, in terms of the quantity c tilde at n plus or minus a few different, plus or minus a few steps. So we'll have two, we'll have some other constant. I'm being a little bit sloppy here. And then we'll have a sum of a few terms. Let's say k equals um, well, minus 3 to 3, something like that, of c tilde of n plus k m t. And this term will bound the commutator of h with psi m. So we've succeeded in getting a bound on the derivative of c tilde in terms of c tilde itself, but at translated points in n. Yeah? Why does little h depend on time? Because little h is only one of the terms in the Hamiltonian. The full Hamiltonian is independent of time, but a single term is not. A single term you could think of as just, let's say, psi 1 times psi 2, or psi 1 times psi 2, psi 3, psi 4, something like that. And those terms are not independent of time. What is our power Sorry? If sum from 3 to 3. Yeah, sorry. Minus 3 to 3. Because if we have terms of length 4, I think it's true that it can only involve fermions of distant sort of starting at positions plus or minus 3. It could be 4. I don't want to swear to this number 3, but uh, it's an order 1 number, which depends on precisely what our definition of locality was for this system. We can complete this argument by um, just solving the differential equation. This equation can be solved easily in so solving the equation where we have an equality here. And that will give an upper bound on c tilde as a function of time. Um, the initial conditions are that it's 0 unless n is equal to m. One second. And um, we can solve the equation simply in Fourier space. So we find n and m t is less than or equal to an integral dk. Fourier space is compact because we're on a lattice of um, e to the i k times n minus m times e to the omega of k t, where omega of k is going to be 2 times the constant plus a sum of phases corresponding to these translations by, by this sum. It was unfortunate to call this k. We call it l. By translations by l. So omega of k will be a constant times a sum of a few phases, like e to the i k, e to the minus i k, e to the plus i, 2 i k, e to the minus i times 2 k. And the Fourier integral here. Uh, 
Sorry? It's over there. I don't think it's interfering with anything. OK. Maybe we could get another one of these, a, a different microphone. Can just try speaking loud? No, I don't want to do that because it's being recorded. Oh. I'll just move it randomly. Let's see if that works. Um, OK, so this integral over momenta can be deformed a little bit into the lower half plane. And um, then we'll find that this expression is exponentially decaying in n minus m. Um, actually, we should deform it a little bit into the upper half plane. So the conclusion of this will be that this quantity here is less than or equal to something times e to the something times time minus something times space. And this is the way the Lee Robinson bound is normally quoted, although this is a somewhat stronger result. So it says that the norm of the anti-commutator between distant operators can't become large until time is at least a multiple of that distance. So this defines a type of emergent light cone in this system. The system didn't start out by having any kind of relativistic symmetry, so it doesn't have an exact light cone. But the result of Lieben Robinson establishes that it has an approximate emergent light cone. So we can draw that in the following way. Let me draw a space time picture, although really we have only a lattice in space. And the result implies that um, there's some emergent light cone where the commutator is small outside of it. So this is time, and this is space. Now, the somewhat surprising thing, which is based on um, numerical work done by a number of different groups, is that in many examples, many actual examples of um, chaotic, let's say, spin chains, or chaotic local quantum mechanical systems, they can compute this type of quantity. And they find, indeed, this emergent light cone. And they find that it's approximately filled. So that everywhere inside the light cone, this guy is um, of order one. In fact, about as big as it can be, which I guess for this case would be two. I'm not completely sure if we should put two or one here. But it doesn't matter too much for the argument. So the picture of um, this type of butterfly effect in spatially extended local systems is that operators are constrained so that they can't grow faster than an emergent light cone, but they sort of fill up the entire interior of that emergent light cone. They become space filling, and they have order one commutators or order one anti-commutators in norm, or in this squared measure, for all sites within that, within that emergent light cone. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. It's a, sort of an approximate ca causal structure. Yeah. Well, in this argument, and this argument is sloppy, but those involve things like the number of, like the degree of non-locality of the system, how many adjacent sites are allowed. Uh, the coefficients of the terms that appear in the Hamiltonian. If you actually follow the Lieber Robinson argument and try to get the constants, you're not likely to get exactly the right speed here. Uh, but you'll see that there should be some speed. Uh, to get the exact speed, I think you really have to do numerics. Do you, do you have some intuition? I mean, based on this argument, the, the fact that the light cone is filled kind of says that the inequalities aren't too bad. So well, they're sort of qualitatively not too bad. But I think they're quantitatively bad. Like, their constants will be wrong. Um, but the fact that the, but yeah, there, it's interesting. There, there might be some sense in which it's all of the steps are approximately saturated. But I don't know what that is. <clears throat> OK, so that's local systems. I want to say a couple things about non-local systems. So um, 
to discuss non-local systems, let's imagine that our fermions are arranged in some way. I'm just drawing them here as a set without any notion of spatial locality. And then the Hamiltonian is allowed to have terms that uh, couple together um, order one numbers of fermions, no matter how far away from each other they are. So all of these groups of fermions could be allowed to participate in the interaction. And that leads to a rather different picture. So for example, the Hamiltonian could contain a term like psi1 times psi2 times psi3 times psi4. And then when we compute the commutator, the first term in the Campbell-Baker-Hausdorff formula, h with psi1, let me put a half here, we'll get a half times psi1, psi2, psi3, psi4, psi1 minus psi1 squared Okay, this is one. We can anti-commute psi one past these three fermions, and then we square it again to get one. This is equal to minus psi two, psi three, psi four. So the operator that started out um, of, um, with size one became an operator of size three. And because we're now studying a non-local system, we can put whatever indices we want here. So the time evolution of the operator will immediately include operators at site 17, 130, and so on. And then the idea is that in subsequent applications, subsequent commutators with the Hamiltonian will have other terms that are similarly non-local. They will act independently, sort of independently, on each of the fermions in this product. So this one will grow into, a, let's say, a product of three operators. This one will also grow. This one, and intuitively, at least, this type of process can lead to exponential growth of the size of the operator. The operator splits into three. Each of those three, in the next time step, can sort of independently split into three operators, and so on and so forth. So this picture was um, sort of first discovered in the context of quantum circuits, and it was articulated in our community in a paper by Hayden and Presco and by Sakino and Susskind. So in this setting, one expects the typical size of the operator to be growing exponentially, at least initially. So the averaged anti-commutator squared with other operators in the system should also be growing exponentially, because that's proportional to the typical size typical length of these fermion products that appear. So there's an important difference between this um, sort of exponential behavior we can have in these non-local, but what's called k-local systems, and the ballistic emergent light cone in Lee Robinson uh, for local systems. I should define the word k-local. This is a terminology which is used to describe systems that are non-local but for which the terms in the Hamiltonian only couple together, let's say, k degrees of freedom at a time. So here, this, the type of interactions I sketched here would be k-local with k equals four. We're never coupling together more than four different fermions at a time. Yeah? Sorry, there was a dumb question about the light code. Mm -hmm. uh, we were proving bounds on the max eigenvalue of the anti-commutator. Do most of the eigenvalues of the anti-commutator saturate like that, or is it are, are most of them following this kind of extremal behavior as shown in these numerical studies, or is it just like there's this one weird eigenvalue? No, I think there's, in practice, I think there's a lot of large, a, a lot of eigenvalues of the same order. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so the discussion so far, yeah. This velocity, uh, without doing the numerics, can you guess at least the order of magnitude uh, of the velocity, like uh, knowing the scale of the problem, or is it completely well, yeah, you, you could, but um, so, yeah, you could. And uh, I'll discuss an example in a moment where, where something like that appears. Any other questions? Yeah. So uh, is there some spin chain uh, like kind of interpretation for this non-looping case? So spin chains are, 
normally the normal ter terminology for spin chains is um, includes by definition that the Hamiltonian is local. It couples only neighbors or nearest neighbors, so next to nearest neighbors or whatever, in a one-dimensional lattice. That's as far as I understand the definition of a spin chain. Uh, and another question was like, is there some uh, boundary effects which play some role, like um, like edge effects? Well, boundary conditions, different boundary conditions for the spin chain would correspond to different. Um, different Hamiltonians, and yeah, that will affect the behavior of the operator, for sure. Yes? Uh, well, in a finite infinite system, I always see these effects, because in that case, any Hamiltonian seems to be a local Hamiltonian. No. Um, well, that depends. Yeah. In a strictly infinite system, it, it wouldn't really make sense to discuss a k-local Hamiltonian. but. In many, in many cases, people discuss large n systems where n is taken to be very large, and there is a reasonable large n limit of those systems where the interactions still allow um, coupling between any degrees of freedom in bounded groups. OK, so the discussion so far has been pretty qualitative, and um, that's not entirely my fault. It's because the subject we're discussing is a complicated one. It has to do with. Uh, evolution of operators in interacting quantum systems. And that's just an intrinsically complicated subject. There are a few approaches for dealing with this. One that we've discussed already is numerics. And the homework problem for this lecture involves uh, a numerical exercise. So you'll, if you do that, you'll get a taste for how this works. Another possibility is to consider general bounds. We saw one example of that. We'll look at another one possibly on Wednesday. Um, what we'll discuss tomorrow is using holography to address this problem. Um, another approach are to use sort of other types of directly solvable models. And I was a little bit surprised to learn that there are examples of this, but um, the SYK model is an example of a solvable model where you can see this happen. And, um, I believe Juan is going to talk a little bit about the SYK model later this week. But there's another approach which we should sort of always have in mind as theoretical physicists when we're trying to solve a difficult problem, and that's to think about um, studying the problem at weak coupling, at leading order in a weak coupling expansion. So that's what I'm going to discuss for the rest of the lecture today. To be concrete, um, what we're going to discuss is a weak coupling computation of these quantities, the decay of the two-point function and the growth of these commutator squares in a, um, in a four-dimensional quantum field theory with the following Lagrangian. We consider a fundamental field that's an n by n Hermitian matrix. And then we have a... Um, Free massive Lagrangian with a small phi to the fourth interaction, a small matrix phi to the fourth interaction. This theory incorporates aspects of both the local and non local systems that we've discussed. So, first of all, in space, this is local. The different sites are coupled together just by this gradient, gradient squared term in the Hamiltonian. So, it's a local theory in space, but sort of at a given point, um, it's, it's a k-local system. One second. So phi is an n by n Hermitian matrix. So we have components phi ij. And if we look at this interaction term, phi to the fourth here, then that looks like phi ij, phi jk, phi kl, phi li. And you can see that for any two um, degrees of freedom within the matrix, so ij and kl can be completely independent from each other, any two degrees of freedom are coupled together by some term in the, in the Hamiltonian, right, in, the, in the Lagrangian. So this is an example of, uh, locally, this is an example of a k-local theory with k equals four. Degrees of freedom are interacting in arbitrary, almost arbitrary groups of four. Yeah, there's a question. Um, in this, we were all the way up 
way through, we were working with infinite uh, temperature, right? Okay. Uh, is there somehow a model or somehow a solvable model to do it in finite temperature? Um, yeah, so you can discuss in the SYK model at finite temperature. <coughs> and uh, here, actually, we'll have to work at finite temperature because quantum field theory doesn't make sense at infinite temperature. So this, this weak coupling analysis will have to be at finite temperature. Yeah. Okay. So in order to try to compute these two-point functions and four-point functions, we're going to have to discuss how to do the perturbation theory in quantum field theory at finite temperature. So let's imagine, before we start calculating correlation functions, that we just want to calculate the partition function. That can be computed by path integral uh, with the following contour in complexified, in complexified time. So here's the plane corresponding to complexified time, so the real part of time and the um, imaginary part of time. And the contour that we study is one that starts at zero and goes down to minus i beta equals t. This is Euclidean time tau equals beta. So this contour computes trace e to the minus beta h, provided that we periodically identify the fields at this point and at that point. So this evolution here gives us the operator e to the minus beta h. It's of length beta in imaginary time. And the trace is implemented by the periodic boundary conditions. Now, if we want to compute expectation values of operators with purely Euclidean time separation, then we can just insert those at some locations along the contour. We can insert operators phi ij of t, phi ij of tau, at different locations. And then we can um, bring down interaction vertices and sew everything together with propagators in the usual way. But um, let's imagine that we want to compute a real-time correlator. So that would be defined as following. Let me consider a two-point function of these fundamental fields with the same indices i and j, but although there's two copies of the index here, we're not going to be summing. So just with a fixed value of i and j, consider this, this correlator. That can be computed using the following contour. So the contour looks like this. It starts at plus i epsilon. It goes out to time t, and then back again. And we insert an operator here at time t. That's the insertion of this operator. And we also insert an operator at uh, time plus i epsilon. That's this first one. So if we follow the ordering of the contour, first we have that operator, then we have phi of t, and then we have um, e to the minus beta h, which is this portion of the contour here. So that's the contour that one would use to compute this quantity. And to do it perturbatively, you would expand down in interaction vertices and sew them together with propagators. Now, if we insert this operator instead at minus i epsilon instead of plus i epsilon, then we'll get this correlator with the opposite ordering between these two operators. We'll encounter this one first on the contour before we encounter phi of zero. And a useful quantity to consider is the difference between these. This is called the retarded propagator. Actually, the retarded propagator comes with a, with a theta of t <coughs> step function, and then the commutator between these operators. This thing is nice to consider in finite temperature quantum field theory for the following reason. 
Naively, this looks like doing perturbation theory here is going to be a mess because we have, you know, this contour is piecewise defined and it will be annoying to keep track of where the interaction vertices are. But for the retarded propagator, where we take the difference between insertions of five zero either before or after the fold, um, things simplify because if, let's imagine that we insert some interaction vertex along this portion of the contour here. Then if we connect it by a propagator to this one and to this one, the two terms where we take the difference of these two orderings will cancel out because it won't depend on the relative ordering of this operator and this operator anymore because they're both contracted with something over here where the ordering is fixed in both cases. So the only terms that contribute in perturbation theory will be terms where we integrate interaction vertices so interaction vertices look like products of four of the fields and represent it by four dots, where we integrate those interaction vertices over this Lorentzian part of the contour. And then, for example, we can contract one of them here, contract one of them here, contract these two together. This gives us the following diagram. In double line notation, since we're dealing with a matrix theory, that diagram looks like this. Okay, and because of the sum over the two sides of the contour that this sits on and the sum here, both of these will be retarded propagators. Retarded propagators, and this will be an ordinary Whiteman propagator. So that's the first non-trivial diagram that contributes to this propagator in perturbation theory. In this theory, um, it's convenient to study it at large n and um, in large n perturbation theory, the expansion organizes itself into one over n corrections and perturbation theory in the parameter lambda, which is g squared times n. So we're going to study this theory with a fixed value of lambda with n large. And that by itself, even though it implies the coupling is small, is not enough to get a solvable theory. Um, in order to make the problem solvable, we'll have to further assume that the coupling lambda is itself small. This is what it means to do the perturbative, the weak coupling analysis of this model. Sorry, yeah. Where's five zero? Five zero is it plus epsilon or is it minus epsilon? Well, we sum over the two in defining the retarded propagator. The retarded propagator is a, involves a commutator of the operators, which means not a sum, but a difference of whether the operator is at plus i epsilon or minus i epsilon. Those are the two terms appearing in the commutator. Okay. So we would like to understand what diagrams have to be summed in order to get exponential decay of the two-point function. In order to see this decay of the two-point function, which is um, related to thermalization. And the family of diagrams one has to sum at weak coupling in order to see that are a bunch of self-energy diagrams. So schematically it looks like this. The perturbative corrections to the retarded propagator include diagrams like this. We can repeat those. And also, we have to include a two-loop self-energy diagram, this one. And we're going to sum over um, many such diagrams like this. The sum of these self-energy corrections is given by um, a formula for the retarded propagator, the dress retarded propagator. I'll call it g hat as a function of omega and k. Omega is the zero component of the momentum four vector. The sum of these self-energy diagrams is given by the following expression, g over omega k inverse minus pi. And here we're discussing the retarded propagator. So this is a retarded propagator and a retarded self-energy. So this pi here is a self-energy. It includes this one loop piece and um, two loop piece and higher orders. 
This first diagram here is proportional to one power of the phi to the fourth interaction. That's g squared. But if you look at this diagram, we also have a closed index loop, so it's g squared n. So this diagram is proportional to lambda. It's easy to see that this diagram is proportional to lambda squared. So since we're working at small lambda, why should we include this diagram? The reason is that the first diagram is sort of trivial. It has actually no dependence on omega k, and this is just a thermal um, dependent renormalization of the mass. So in particular, this does not lead to exponential decay in time of the correlator. But the second diagram does, and the reason is that this diagram has an imaginary part. It has an imaginary part, and when we put that here, the pole in this expression as a function of omega will be shifted off the real axis. And when we Fourier transform back to time, we'll find g retarded of t and k will be proportional to e to the minus gamma k of t, where gamma is proportional to the imaginary part of this diagram, which determines how far off the real axis we have to go to find the pole uh, in, that we pick up when we do the Fourier transform. Because this diagram is of order lambda squared, the Tuft coupling squared, this gamma here will be proportional to lambda squared. So a weak coupling will have a very slow but exponential decay of the two-point function. Now, I want to give you a tiny bit of intuition for this imaginary part. Um, you might remember from zero temperature quantum field theory that if you have a massive particle, that it can decay to a particle with mass that's less than half through this diagram, which has an imaginary part that you diagnose by cutting it and putting the internal propagators on shell. However, this diagram in zero temperature quantum field theory does not have an imaginary part because if you try to cut it and put the propagators on shell, you can't have an on-shell process where one particle decays into three particles of the same mass. So this diagram does not have an imaginary part. However, in finite temperature quantum field theory, um, this diagram does have an imaginary part. And the reason is that when we put the propagators on shell, we can give them either positive or negative energies at the cost of thermal factors. So we can have an on-shell process where one particle with positive energy turns into two particles with positive energy and one particle with negative energy. Another way of saying it is that um, our particle is going along and the particle with negative energy in the final state can be interpreted as a particle with positive energy in the initial state. Our particle is going along and it gets hit by a particle that is present in the thermal state. It then turns into two different particles in the final state. So the exponential decay of the two-point function is because um, quanta can get hit by something in the thermal state and get knocked out of their state, knocked out of the, both their momentum state and their matrix index state. So that's the physics of the exponential decay of the two-point function. We can think about this as des describing a step in operator growth where a single particle, a single quantum operator is turning into a product of three. We have an operator growth that looks like a dagger, creation operator, turning into a product of two A daggers and an A. So like a particle turning into two particles and a hole. Okay. So that was a bit quick, but that's the physics of the exponential decay of the two-point functions in this weakly coupled phi to the fourth theory. What about the growth of out-of-time order correlators? The growth of these double commutators. Yeah? What about the interactions that appear in this segment as well? 
Sorry? What about the interaction vertices in this segment of both the minus type beta? Yeah. So I explained this, but it was too quick. Um, if we have interaction vertices that are present here, let's think about how we're going to contract them with propagators. Let's imagine that we have four dots here. And in order that this should contribute to the connected correlator, then we should connect one of those dots to this guy, one of those dots to these guys, and then the other two to themselves, just like this diagram, but on the vertical portion of the contour. Now, when we take the difference between the two orderings, where we take the difference between the, this operator being at plus i epsilon and minus i epsilon, we'll have the difference of two terms that are equal because the ordering between these two operators and an operator on the contour here is the same, regardless of the sign of epsilon. So those two terms will cancel. In other words, that diagram will not give a contribution to the retarded propagator, although it would give a contribution to just the other propagators. But isn't the distance to the one along the contour to the one upstairs is larger than the distance to the So the, the distance is, differs only by epsilon. So you don't count the entire No, no. It, it depends. The propagators are only a function of the difference of times. Um, not, I, I believe it's not, I, I believe it does not appear in, within this family of diagrams, so at this order. Um, I don't want to make a definite statement about whether it could appear at higher order diagrams. Well, yeah, so we have to use, sorry. We have to use the thermal propagators for these guys here. So those will depend on that, the length of that contour. Yes, but naively, if there were no interactions in that contour, we wouldn't be discussing a thermal ensemble with the interacting Hamiltonian. So one would think that somehow the interaction vertices on that contour must eventually. Well, those interaction vertices will be tied together with propagators that depend on the thermal state. So um, if this diagram is laid out along that double fold, then we'll have a propagator, product of three propagators connecting these two times here. And those propagators will depend on the thermal state. And that's important because um, the fact that those are thermal propagators is what allows the diagram to have an imaginary part. So, So that doesn't matter at the order that's necessary to compute this quantity, because you can just put the free propagators here. <clears throat> yeah? What is the behavior of the other propagators? What is the behavior of what, sorry? Of all the kind of propagators. Yeah, they will also be exponentially decaying and uh, with the same decay rate. But the computation is slightly, well, we don't get to make this argument. So I wanted to discuss the commutator squared, but I only have five minutes left. So maybe I'll leave that for tomorrow and um, just see if there are questions now. Yeah. What does the exponential decay imply for transport? Um, well, normally, so the propagator of this phi isn't directly important for transport. But um, there are things that you build out of phi that are, like the stress tensor, which would be a bilinear of the phi. And so, for example, computations of uh, the viscosity in this theory um, actually take as an ingredient the computation of the exponential decay of this phi propagator. You have diagrams um, involving two extended pairs of these phi propagators connected with um, the ladder diagrams. There's a very nice analysis of that question, actually, by Jayon, um, you doing perturbation theory in the five to the fourth theory. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Sorry, I think Alex had his hand up first. Uh, can it, it can't decay faster than an exponential function because of the unitarity, or can it be like a double exponential, for example, the retarded propagator? 
Um, well, just the product theory. Certainly not perturbation, not in perturbation theory. What happens in perturbation theory is the singularities in this thing in frequency space just move a little bit into the um, complex plane. And so when you do the Fourier transform, you'll pick those up in the. Um, <laughs> Sorry? I was just talking uh, Well, I'm not sure exactly why, but you could if you want. Um, yeah, there was another question? Uh, yeah, um, my question is uh, why there is no exponential growth? Why are there? Yeah. Why there's no exponential growth? Uh, how do you show the gamma k here is positive? Um, Um, I think, well, basically, I'm not sure if this is the best answer to that question, but for example, in, in the zero temperature quantum field theory, you show that the imaginary parts of these diagrams have a definite sign by representing them as a um, product of matrix elements squared. And um, the computation of the imaginary part of this diagram at finite temperature is similar. You just have uh, matrix elements that involve particles in the initial state and um, thermal Bose factors. So it would have a definite sign for that reason. But there's definitely going to be some better explanation that I don't want to try to produce in real time. Yeah? If I start with a representation of this by operators, Block diagonal, with only one of the blocks, one to n. Is there an estimate for the time when uh, the operator grows and the structure becomes scrambled? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's um, in order to compute that, you have to look at the um, square of the commutator. And uh, that's the second half of the weak coupling discussion, which I'm going to have to defer until tomorrow. But um, you find the time scale, which is um, 1 over the Etoft coupling squared times the logarithm of n squared. So it's a long time at weak coupling. Yeah? Sorry, I, could you repeat the question? The, Well, so in classical chaos, let's discuss one of these quantities. The, let's discuss, for example, the Lyapunov exponents. So um, those things are defined normally for some kind of ergodic submanifold of phase space. And um, that would be something, in principle, that could be defined for a fixed energy. Um, that's sort of the minimal type of um, uh, submanifold you could consider. But um, but you can also, def and, but they would depend on the energy. So the Lyapunov exponents would depend on the energy. And so here we're considering the thermal ensemble, and uh, that's like an integral over a weighted average of these things, and the Lyapunov exponents will depend on the temperature for that reason. Yeah. Is there a way to see the stability of the exponents? Is there a way what? To see the stability of the exponents. You mean quantum mechanics? We haven't got to the computation of that yet, so maybe you could ask the question tomorrow. Uh, because I was asking about this life form, about the, uh, the deep loss and bonds. About subleading Lyapunov exponents? I don't remember that question. The biggest exponent versus the other one? Sorry, oh, OK, I do remember the, the other one. Yeah, um, yeah I, I'm not sure. If I remember right, for a given value of momentum, k, there's only one positive growth mode in the commutator squared. So there would be one exponential growth as a function of the momentum k. But I really shouldn't be talking about this because I haven't defined the thing yet. So we can talk about it tomorrow. 
is the Lyapunov experiment uh, related to Poisson modes because they are all describing the late behavior of the system? Um, this is something we'll discuss tomorrow, but no, the quasi-normal modes are related to these Ruel resonances, and the Lyapunov exponents are um, are related to something else. We'll we'll see that tomorrow. Okay. Well, we're over time, so uh, let me stop there. Thank you very much.